You are listening to the Level Up Your Gaming Podcast, episode 103, Better NPC Creation Again. In today's episode, we talk about better NPC creation once again. Jared has some new techniques that he is using which makes for a better NPC creation. We also discuss how you can make your world feel more fleshed out with better NPC creation than it actually may be. If you'd like to participate in the discussion or leave us feedback, you can contact us at levelupyourgamingpodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash levelupyourgaming. If you like the content and want to hear more of the show, subscribe and we'll ensure you don't miss an episode. New episodes come out almost every Wednesday. Also, please review, tell a friend about the podcast, or share with your gaming group. Now sit back and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Level Up Your Gaming Podcast. My name is Aaron, and joining me virtually because my tires on my car don't seem to want to cooperate with me this year, uh, Jared. <laughs> How you doing today, Jared? Good. Not bad. I mean, better than you, obviously. Yeah, I didn't um, even know if we were going to get this recording in, given the uh, the nature of what just happened. <laughs> Don't worry, we're gonna get you some nice off-road tires for your for your beautiful car. Okay, <laughs> gonna look so hideous and monstrous. It's not. They're they're gonna look very classy. I assure you. Um, actually, this this week, um, when I was I, I traveled to uh, uh, Arkansas for some account meetings, I got my Dodge Ram, my 2018 Dodge Ram Black. Oh, <laughs> I was having. I was having a moment. It's the truck of my dreams, but um, it doesn't have the the two and a half inch lifting uh, or leveling puck. So there's some there's some things that still needed to be done. But oh, I was I was I was overjoyed. Yes, and so. we were we were supposed to actually have an interview with another uh, podcasting group, yeah. um, yeah. and we're hopefully going to get that rescheduled here um and you know get that out to you soon um so to to the guys over at venture forth ethan and shane shane particularly i'm sorry uh if you're listening to this uh, did uh, just the world didn't want the world didn't want me to get to jared's today (laughs) no on the highway on the the, highway that's the most terrifying part of the story is it's on a chicago land highway yeah it's on a major highway it was nothing but a suggestion (laughs) yes there there was no regard like i'm sitting there with my flashers on and like an emergency pull-off because i'm in between construction and like people are just like (laughs) like, right behind me i'm like chicago traffic bumper to bumper at 70 miles an hour i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna die like (laughs) (laughs) when 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 aaron actually called me uh i was like do not exit the vehicle (laughs) like whatever you do until there's emergency lights behind you yeah it was it was it was bad i'm like i'm like man this guy when he got out there i was like oh my god i'm like I feel so bad. So I, I I I could I couldn't look back at like the car the car is coming in because it's all one lane and we're just right off this emergency pull off and I'm just like somebody's gonna somebody's gonna clip him and I'm gonna have to then call nine one one and be like I just witnessed a murder. <laughs> Technically, it would most likely be negligent manslaughter. Yeah, yeah, you know whatever one it is, but you know still I just I've. <laughs> I'm sitting there like, oh my god, like <laughs> plead it down, just manslaughter. So, but uh, here I am. I'm back. It took me forever to get back home. I, I'm on a <laughs> we donut. Did not think we were going to make this, <laughs> this podcast. Yes. I was like, there's no freaking way. No, no. But here we are, and uh, we're going to give you a subject uh, again. Sorry about last week. Uh, I didn't just didn't record and uh we we're, we are lacking in the hopper so we're going to fill that thing back up and we're going to get you some good content here and we're starting with this week's episode which is creating better npcs numero dos we are going to be talking about it a second time because jared <laughs> has some new methods and some new techniques that we need to talk about i do um so you know it's been quite a while since we've talked about how to build a better NPC. And a lot of times we focus on villains and um, specifically the, the antagonists of your story. Um, this time, what I have really done over the last couple of months has, has been evolving and literally was only the application of three different changes. Now that I've numbered them, I'm going to forget them as I go. So I hope, I hope everyone's ready for that. 
number three um, might surprise you because Jared will forget it. Because <laughs> Jared will forget it. So the first change I actually had was, um, you know, and, and Aaron actually, Aaron and Brian provided me some, some really good feedback on that, um, was developing my descriptions. So in my descriptions, uh, I started adding appearance levels. Um to the descriptions and Aaron and Brian reported that they both liked that because they could understand, you know, is this person an average looking person? Are they one of the pretty people? Are they a supermodel? Are they fug ugly like I am? Um, you know, so they, they, they started, I've started adding that in at the very end because it is a, in White Wolf, it is a dot related system so, you know, I'd say they have three levels of appearance or they have two levels of appearance. It doesn't mesh with the entire uh, flowness. Flowness? <laughs> it doesn't match with how I usually do the description, which is, you know, uh, very uh, formulaic. Um, so I started adding that to the end. And I got into a good discussion with Brian and Aaron about um, ways to evolve my description making. And Aaron said, you know what? You put the clothing in and really i i don't need to know that like it, it just hinders uh the the description because i'd always come up to this problem of what are they wearing um and the thing is is that unless you are doing a you know a D, &D campaign or you're going with let's say a more thematic uh uh, uh system like firefly if you look at firefly they they almost never change clothes um or in an area where essentially people wear the same clothes every day you know wild west you really didn't have that much selection uh you know you might have two outfits <laughs> um and in the dark ages you probably have one pair of pants um so but in the modern times, you know, we, we all tend to wear different clothes on different days. Uh, you know, some days I wear my Batman shirt. Some days I wear my Wonder Woman shirt. Uh, some days I, I, I wear, you know, uh, I don't know, enter X. Now, But if you're at home and it's to... cold, you'll always be wearing a cardigan. <laughs> Even when it's hot, I'm always wearing a cardigan. <laughs> Okay, because like cardigans are the perfect sweater. <laughs> All right, you do. You always <laughs> wear that cardigan. <laughs> I, I like cardigan sweaters. I think I look very fetching. Do you disagree? It's it's very Jared. I I I cannot deny it's very Jared. It's it. It's the, it's the hills in me. Okay, we we like our 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 knit sweaters. Okay, I I come from a trailer park, but you know. I come from the hills, <laughs> but um, the, the the thing is though, uh, clothing typically changes day to day. Um, so what I've started doing is I've started removing that actually. Now again, in D and D, that might be different. You know, you don't have a wide variety of of clothes. Um, but if you're writing for the modern era, it's very difficult to. Um, do the clothing aspect you might go into a little bit like for example you know if you're writing me as an NPC you may say he very commonly wears superhero shirts it's it, it's a point of the of the character that actually makes something makes a point about their personality is it worth it is there a payoff to understanding that Okay, if I put in my NPC description that he's always comically wear or comically wearing, he's always wearing comic book related uh, clothing. This is something your players can use, right? If they want to build a relationship with that person, engage them in a discussion about comic books. Are they always wearing hero uh, stuff? He's probably a person who wants to do good in this world. You know, you don't see many people wearing. Batman shirts out selling drugs. I mean, it happens. I, I worked in a school where there was a kid who literally sold drugs and wore Batman. I was like, got a problem with that. Um, Batman doesn't deal drugs. Um, so, but it, it, is there a payoff to that information? So I started removing that, but I did start keeping in my notes just in a different section. I put clothing 
Now, Aaron and I uh, and Brian, uh, we do a episodic, as everyone knows, we do a very episodic gaming. Now, one of the things is, is that I have, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure if I ever discussed this with the audience. I dealt with a, a little bout of um, some depression. Um, you know, I feel it's always healthy to, to discuss that with our audience, because if you two are ever feeling, uh, you know, dealing with some depression, it's, it's smart to seek friends, family, uh, and, and um, medical professionals to assist you through that. Fortunately, I, I only needed friends and family to kind of get through this little bout. I was traveling a lot and I got a little, got a little uh, under the weather with some, just some mild depression. Um, but um, now that I'm back in the saddle, I'm writing, right now I'm writing five games simultaneously. Um, <laughs> Aaron doesn't even know about three of them because I've come up with them in the last two weeks and we haven't been able to get together because I've been on the road and, and busy schedules and I got back last weekend and I said, Guys, I'm just not in the headspace to do it because, I mean, I, I I literally flew in one day, flew out the next day, things were happening in my company and I'm running around trying to do everything. But back to the point, um, I did keep clothing in my thing, uh, in my notes of the NPC because for me it has value. I like to know um, what are they wearing, but the thing is that I started doing because I don't know when these games are going to go off. Could be in the summer because Aaron's game might take five months. And, uh, you know, in game time, five months, you know, we might skip ahead and, and be in April or June or July. So what I started doing was dividing winter and summer clothing, right? So what do they wear in the winter? What do they wear in the summer? It's just a good tip to use because if you write it in your notes that they're always wearing flowing dresses, what happens when it's negative three outside? What are they wearing then? Because you don't know if they're going to encounter that NPC in the future at a different season or a different location. You know what? They, they, they meet this uh, princess of a very Middle Eastern uh, style kingdom, right? Where it's, it's hot, it's desert terrain, uh, in that sort of climate but then she's up in uh, 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 let's go with a Norse style uh, area um, doing trade talks you know it, it, it's it's just a nice little tip to use so you have it for future use and again you know focus on those NPCs that 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 matter you don't want to waste too much time and, and get into the uh, same problem that I did when I developed an entire uh, subplot about kitchen staff um, planning the succession over the, to be the next head chef. This, this is always the challenge, which is the just enough problem. So yes. Jer Jared's right. I mean, anybody who's really important, make sure they've got the right descriptions, make sure they know what they need to know. Um, and then everybody else is sort of ancillary to that. But here's the, the, the thing that you need to do is to cover the just enough problem up, you have to have just a little bit more to make it look like you put enough thought into these other NPCs that it isn't they just like a that they, they're, they're a possibility, that they're important in some way. And it also makes you that extra little bit makes you look super well prepared and very much like a wizard. Um, in, in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, because people are like, whoa, did he think about that? Did you like the question that that, I, that you typically get at the end of a game? OK, and if you've never sat in the GM's chair before, uh, and this is why I would urge you to do it and try to, to to understand it, is that the amount of stuff that your players are going to say at the end of the game, which is like, did you intend on doing X, Y, Z? Did you have that planned? Like, I don't know if you had that planned. It was so cool. Like, I really liked that because, like, I didn't, I didn't know if that was a thing. Like, there's a lot that goes into that, which is because you don't have the full picture behind the curtain. Um, you know, having just that little bit of extra prep beyond just enough goes a long way to the illusion of really a well prepared game. And that's that's really really important in that regard. The illusion of a well-prepared. 
<laughs> well, it is. It, it is an illusion of a well-prepared game because the, the idea is that your players think, I, you know, I know Jared, Jared didn't put enough work into Sheriff Friendly over there and Sheriff Friendly is not, must not be that important. Well, like that, that's what you get the more that you interact with more and more NPCs. And from a, I, I guess I'm kind of sort of speaking from our game situation, which is a lot of information gathering and who you're talking to and trying to, to unravel the mystery behind something. Um, it's a little bit different than like, uh, you know, if you're doing like a D and D campaign, you might be more pointed towards the NPCs that you need to be interacting with. Um, but you know, your, your players are going to be drawn to different NPCs for different reasons. And to have enough of a description behind a lot of NPCs, um, does show that anybody in this world then matters. Okay. Like that's what you're, that's what you're trying to, to, to do is, is show that like this person could matter. They probably don't. I probably just gave them five seconds of thought, which is why Jared's formula is really great because it's just like, knock me out an NPC in a description. And I can then sort of filter information through that NPC and you know a personality through that NPC and you're sort of none the wiser because I gave them that little bit of dressing on the front of them that you have no idea how deep I went into that character because everybody has the same dressing okay yep and Precisely. like that's that's the illusion that I'm, I'm talking about which is the illusion of a really complete game it's not every NPC and you talk to is complete it's just that the ones that you do talk to everybody seems complete Right, and it, and you can think of it like this in movie making. Even extras in the background, you can see how they look. They might not even have a speaking role, but you can see how they look. And just the description is enough to provide that, oh, that's a person, that's an individual. Um, but getting on to point number two, so, so clothing was, was my first one. My second one and third, actually, I get to say, um, do come from a, another system that I intended on doing a, a gaming session with. Um, I intended, it, uh, it's called Blades in the Dark. Um, I love their book. I love the setting that they developed. The, the storytelling possibilities of this game are fantastic. If you have the opportunity uh, to to read the the book or gather some of the materials, I highly recommend it. Uh, I will say that the combat and skill system is a little difficult to understand. I watched like four tutorials on it, still don't understand it, uh, and that's why I chose to go a different direction because I'm like I'm never going to get this. Um, so I, I, if you're up for a challenge with a new system, Blaze in the Dark is definitely a, a good challenge. Uh, I think, uh, but then again, I am of limited intellectual capability. I'm a dumbass. Um, <laughs> there are much smarter people out there than me who can look at this and be like, oh yeah, this is easy. Um, I was like, fuck, I'm gonna have to make cue cards, God damn it. Um, <laughs> so the the thing that I want to, um, but their their character building is is pretty cool. They had a section in there. And I'm not sure if there are other systems out there that have this. I haven't encountered one. It's the first time I've, I, I have encountered it. It says there's two things you need to add to every NP, or three things. Um, so I guess technically I had four things to talk about. Was closest friend, rival, and vice. So closest friend and rival. And this is, I, I, I can't stress how cool this was to build so Aaron and our game uh, Aaron and my and Brian's game as you know um, it takes place in a lot of small towns in America um, you know because that's that's where the, the, the haunting happens look at any good haunting film it's a small town in America um, it's difficult to do major cities um, because you know call the cops <laughs> monster on the loose call the cops um, <laughs> they will come um but with building small towns, and I think this is really beneficial for our D&D &D players out there um, because 
villages are small in the Dark Ages, um, which is what d is based on. It's not exactly the Dark Ages, but villages aren't very big. Um, even if like, looking at a lot of D&D maps, these are not large cities. They're pretty small. You can see houses. You know, you look at a satellite picture of Chicago, you got a block. You know, that, 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 that's even difficult to comprehend how many people live in there. Um, so the thing about the closest friend and, and, and rival is it lets your imagination flow and it builds another NPC um, in your town without, without going, okay, who does the baker know? So when I started building this game that I haven't told Aaron about, um, I started off with one major NPC and I came up to the closest friend. I was like, okay, who's his closest friend? And then I, I said, okay, it's going to be this person. We'll say person X, you know, and in my mind, I've just kind of let my imagination wander and say, what do they do? They're a bartender. Okay. Okay, cool, cool. And suddenly I had a new NPC for this very small town, the bartender named X. So I finished up that NPC and guess where it naturally led me? It led me to develop NPC X. I put in their closest friend. Now, NPC X actually doesn't consider, or sorry, NPC Y, the, the next individual, doesn't consider NPC X to be their closest friend. Their closest friend is actually NPC Z. And it made another person. Now, sometimes you will come up against the buttress of, NPC X and NPC Y are, are best friends with each other. Like that's it. Those two are, are connected and it doesn't give you another one, but rivals are different. So it let me explore. And, and, and what I didn't do was I didn't attach. It's having the rival is completely separate from the main villain in building this town. Uh, the, the rival, let, let, let's take a hypothetical situation because I don't want to give away too much for Aaron. Um, the, the, the rival is going to be, uh, you know what, let's make it the baker. And why do they hate each other? I don't know. Um, they went to school together. The, the baker, you know, was kind of a bully because he's just a bigger kid. You know, and, and this rivalry has grown even to the, even to their middle ages. And it's such an innocent thing, right? It's a rival. It's not a it's not an enemy that I must destroy and kill. It's just simply a rival. It's it's their person that they just can't stand dealing with. And it, it creates a more natural uh, environment. Because think about it, most people that you don't like in your life. You're not looking to take them out back and, and, you know, bury them in a shallow grave. You just don't want to deal with them. Just like, get out of my life. The less I can deal with you, the better. Right? It's that That's person the at work that you don't like. It's the, <laughs> you know, it's, right. the, it's, it's, it's the guy down the street that you're just like, I can't stand Gary. Or whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, and Gary. I did. Then- <laughs> <laughs> Gary's going to write a very long email just for you for that. Um, Gary, go get him. Gary, dude. I appreciate um, you very much. It's, I just I picked out a name and I'm like, crap. Oh, that's, uh, that's the name of a guy we know. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's that person down the street that I just, I, I cross the street to avoid just because I don't want to deal with them. And it, it's so much more human. It's so much more soulful. You can even do this with, with other species like lizard men or, or alien races like the Mon Calamari. You know, if I'm saying that right, oh my God, if you Star Wars fans go after me for that, I, fine, I'll stick to Star Trek. Vulcan, you know, even Vulcans have rivals. They try to suppress their emotions because I know a lot about Vulcans, okay? They try to suppress their emotions. It doesn't mean they're emotionless. Okay, they still have that. Okay, it's not sucked out of them. Um, but the what it welcomes is is that more soulful, that more human element 
to your NPCs, which makes them more human to your players. And it grows these small communities and it can get out of control. And that's where, you know, Aaron, Aaron's warning is really vital to follow because, you know, if their greatest rival is a woman five, you know, blocks down that they just don't want to talk to. And just, they're like, oh man, you're horribly bigoted. I hate talking to her. Don't dive into making that NPC just because they live five blocks down. It just makes that character more human. Leave that NPC alone. I don't need to make the grandmother who lives five blocks down. Okay. That's where you gotta, you gotta limit it. You actually, but, it, it, again, going back to the just enough, point there i mean it, what jared's doing is you're opening up a big web of you know you could you can end up 30 people down the line and you're like none of these people have anything to do with my story um right. and that that's that you don't want to be in that spot either so like what i like about your approach here with the the rival and the best friend is that you go hey, here's the people who are important to my story Okay, and then I can just kind of add some spokes to these people to be able to yes. flesh out the world. Because then when I talk to these people or when I talk to people adjacent to these people, then I've got people now who are able to connect me back to the people that I really need to know to get the story uh, completed. It was actually a very interesting article. Uh, so at work, we have a tabletop RPG Slack group. And, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I go into it and there is a conflicting opinion on one of these things to do like with uh with working through like a mystery or working around a game itself and one of the gms who uh who, who spoke up there actually spoke very true to what we sort of preach here in this podcast which was if you leave the town and the towers in the north and they go to the south the players don't know the tower was supposed to be in the north okay yeah. They don't know. So if you put the tower in the south and the players run into the tower, guess what? Your players aren't any wiser to that situation unless you wish to divulge that information to you. And somebody said, well, that's a pretty contentious point. Like, you know, a lot of people will like say like, like to hell and, and be damned. I'm like, I'm like, you always have to build yourself an out though. Like if you are not willing to build yourself an out, if you are not willing to adjust on the fly, you are likely going to be met with a lot of people sitting there going, I don't know what to do next, okay? Unless they've been explicitly told what to do next. And even then, they're likely not going to do what you're told them to do next, okay? <laughs> but what I actually ended up bringing up was somebody pointed out a great um, a great uh, article about uh, the, the best way to, to work around these problems, which is have three solutions for every problem, effectively. Um, and, like, the reason why three solutions works is, like, if... The mummy's hand is behind a secret door in the dungeon, okay? If I don't have any other solutions, the only way to find the mummy's hand is to find the secret door. So I roll my check to find the secret door. If I miss it, okay, well, the key element to getting through the rest of the story is behind the secret door. So if you have no other ways to ascertain the information or to get to the, the mummy's hand, meaning like maybe you do a favor for someone and tell it, someone tells you about a mummy's hand that's in a dungeon, or, uh, you know, maybe you, you do this other thing or you read a book in the library and the book has, has the, the piece of information you're looking for. Now there are three ways to do it. The, the searching, the, the reading a book, somebody else has the information. Okay. Now you have ways to, to get to that information. And that's sort of what the spoken wheel sort of thing that Jared's working with here with the NPCs where you build your point and then you have these other pieces that can get you to the piece of information that you need to get to. And so I, I really like the idea of the rival and the, the friend because that then so gives his closest you... friend. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing is, is it doesn't have to be a friend. So that's the great thing about blades in the dark is they're talking about their closest friend. So this can be a lover. It can be a, a family member. Uh, it, it can be just a friend you know could um but it's supposed to be the closest person the person that they they divulge their inner secrets to and stuff like that so it does just as as that one uh gm proposed give that 
alternative method to getting the information. Because, for example, in, in, in Blades of the Dark, the book, you know, if, if you're building Jared, the NPC closest friend is Allie, his wife. Um, you know, and she's not just a friend, she's my wife, you know, but they just categorize it as closest friend. You could, you could say closest relation if you wanted to in your own notes. And, um, and rival is just so, the person that you more or less dislike the most. <laughs> dislike the most, not, you know, and, and it could be somebody that they want to bury out back six feet deep. They're, they're, they're not, they're not like, like, you know, competing and like, in like, oh, we're, I'm, I'm rivals with this person. Like we're always, we're always having a lawn mowing competition. It's not that it's, it's that I just don't like that person. And and, and, and maybe actually to be perfectly honest, I'm not going to debate the, 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 the guy who wants to, to, to you compete in lawn mowing competitions five times a week, because that's something. That's something like what is going on there? Because Blades in the Dark, what I really like about their system is they welcome your imagination to just blah, to just flow like a waterfall. You know, it, it welcomes you to embrace the enjoyment of world building and, and creating your story. It's not so cold and formulaic like I am. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's very much um, saying, let things flow. And when the water drip, dribbles out into a different direction, that's okay. I really have to say the, the people who designed the story of Blades in the Dark, those elements and components, they really did a fantastic job. Uh, if, if only their combat and skill system was not so overly goddamn complicated. Um, you know, hopefully maybe one day they'll, listen to this podcast and reach out to me and explain it to me because I would I would love to talk to them about it. Um, heck, maybe we'll reach out to that, see if we can interview that. Um, so one of the things that, that you know, uh, the, the, the rival is, is supposed to be is definitely that person that you, you are the, it's, I don't want to use the word enemy. It's too strong, but it can be the enemy. It can be the guy that- It can, it can know, literally oh be the, the word- it's my rival or it could just be the guy that you just don't get along with that you just just don't want to see like eh. every every time i go to the store there's this guy who's who's sampling every deli meat and i'm like ah hate that guy and, <laughs> and rivals can change over time friends become enemies enemies become friends i mean jesus even i have a rival and i i'm i tend to be a very forgiving person you know i'm a catholic i get catholic guilt when i don't forgive somebody you know like i'm like oh man i hate them and i shouldn't do that it, catholic guilt it's weird um <laughs> so. but, uh, but again that's those are very interesting points that when it comes down to the rival what's uh what was your third point the vices the vices um so the vices um you know, when, when I looked at uh, White Wolf, when they did their reconfiguration, they did like Vampire, the, um, uh, what was it called? Something with an R. It was Werewolf of Forsaken, Vampire, the... Oh, Vampire, the, the Requiem or something? Yeah, the Requiem. Vampire, the money-making scheme, because that's, I'm sorry, I will, I will land bash against White Wolf. That was all just a money-making scheme. All of it. Um, it always is, Jared. Well, no, <laughs> they they went too far. <laughs> like I am, I am angry about them, and I was so happy when they came out with the Onyx Path and uh, just reissued the books with with you know more information, compiling all that information. Um, so the, the the third one is vices. Now it, these are not cold hard vices like they welcome you in White Wolf. Like they they say it has to be the seven deadly sins essentially. You know. To, to, greed, lust, you know, vengeance or wrath. Wrath is actually vengeance. Um, so Blaze in the Dark does categorize it a little bit too much, in my opinion, because they, they make it weird. They make it, you know, they, they have certain categories. Um, but I took their their um, system and I made it more like their their closest friend and rivals and like the rest of their book. It was kind of an off section comparatively to the others because it didn't just follow that path of blah 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 blah. Here's here's a lake. Jump into it of creativity. Um, so 
the thing about it was um, vice is supposed to be what you take your pleasure in. And, and it's got to, it's something that refills your cup, right? Um, if you were doing Jared the NPC, you might say it's it's um, video games and role playing. Um, I love playing video games. I love role playing, and it's something that refills my cup. Um, it's something that I do when I have that uh, opportunity to do it, and I don't go. Ugh. You know, it's it's something that I enjoy and I actually actively seek and engage in. That's actually really interesting um, that that's how they just that's how they describe it. Where it's not like this is something I need to have to satiate my life, or you know, to to get by day to day. It's more of what I need to do to to, to you know recharge my batteries. That's the mm-hmm. interesting. Um, it, it's you know because there there's something and there are people that you know follow um that that lust for them is how they recharge their battery they go out they date they 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 try to you know find some way to make a physical relationship happen that's and when they do they're happier for it there are those people that do go out and seek violence and they're happier for it um you know and and not even in a negative way of like i'm a hitman and i love really being a hitman um (laughs) I mean, there are those individuals, they're serial killers that, that that's their thing. But, you know, there are the people that, that are boxers, you know, pugilists. Th- that for them is a release. It refills their batteries when they get in there and hit the heavy bag or hit another guy. You know, they love that shit. There's people who enjoy, really enjoy shooting um, even more than I do because is shooting is something that I like to do um, and I, I love to do it. It's something I don't have the opportunity to do a lot. So I don't find it very recharging for me because it's not very, um, accessible. Right. You know, I just can't grab and go, I can just pick up my laptop, bam, start gaming. You know, I'm now, you know, a Viking out in Valhalla. Um, uh, I can pick up my laptop and I can start creating stories and being creative. And when I get up, I am happier because I'm getting those juices out. Um, and when you start building that in, it, what it does is it welcomes a very cool scene, right? When your players go to meet their NPC, not when they're engaged in their job, right? Let's take the tavern guy, right? The bartender. We love picking on the bartender. Um, the bartender, you know, he's going to have a day off every now and then. What is he doing when the players come to meet him at his home? I don't think he's there cleaning the glass. Like, ah, yeah. Or maybe he is. I don't know. Maybe he's, you know, got a touch of what I got. He's got OCD and he really loves cleaning. Um, <laughs> that's a, it's a, such a good point because, you know, you, if you're going to talk to somebody, especially in a modern situation, in a modern game, it's a little bit different in D&D, because in D&D, you'd probably go to, like, the tavern and be like, hello, Mr. Tavern Keeper, what, what's going on? Like, talk See, to me. See, but that, that's the basic way. The Tavern Keeper, now, granted, in the Dark Ages, essentially your career was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but you did have, there was very little free time, but there was free time. Yeah, so the, 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 this is interesting because in the in the modern nights, the modern era, when like, you're kind of thinking, uh, you know, the standard forty hour work week for a lot of people, um, you know, you look at you don't you you couldn't just you typically if, if I went into a bar, I started trying to talk to to interrogate the bartender. Okay, they'd be like, "Uh, it's freaking busy. Can you like not talk to me right now?" <laughs> and Can you so, come back. But whenever like, can, can, you, can you can you can you come talk to me anytime that i'm not working behind this bar uh, <laughs> and that like that's that sort of spawns the next bit which is like okay well now we're we're gonna go maybe, maybe they're willing enough to give you the the information to meet them outside of work well what are they doing outside of work i go you know rollerblading every other day like you know whatever it might be like so you can find me at the park like there, 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 there's an example of what you just said, 
you're going to go meet that person. Like, or you, you get an address for somebody who works at the bar, but you're like, oh, well, I'll just go meet them at their home. Well, you're either going to meet them before they're going to work, right after they get off work, or like Jared said, on a day off. What are they doing? What's their demeanor they when they get there? And it gives you something about the character that just helps define them and makes them more soulful and human. Everyone needs something to recharge their batteries. When we're not recharging our batteries as human beings, we, we get, we get dark. We, we, we hurt. I mean, that's going, going back to what I dealt with a couple of months ago. I never had time to recharge my batteries and it started getting to me. Um, you know, and what this really does is it, it, it gives them activity. It gives them, uh, you know, there. It, it's funny, um, you know, talking about uh, our, our friend uh, Anthony, um, former combat Marine, uh, big old guy. Uh, he loves gardening and cooking. Like that is, I would say cooking is probably his vice. He loves to cook. Uh, I mean, remember the Aaron, I don't remember when he made the, the, the bacon cupcakes for Nick. Oh, you know? I, I, I only wish I could have had them because they sounded so good. They were like, you know, ba- I mean, they were like bacon wrapped cinnamon rolls. <laughs> 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 it's, it's it just gives a new element because if 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 you met our our friend on an average day if you just saw him you would you would think him a very intimidating figure he's got a very big beard he's tattooed he's he's a giant man you know um you would think he probably shoots cans in the backyard every day <laughs> and, and yeah and drinks beer and 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 you know is a rough and gruff guy but there's a part to him that just loves cooking. I mean, like you get him on cooking. Oh my God, you are, you're in for it. Cause he'd be like, I'll give you, I'll give you the recipe. I'll give you the recipe. You know, and he, and he, and he wants other people to join him in cooking. He loves cooking, but it gives him such a different uh, element. Um, when you come to his house, if, if you are creating that NPC, Anthony's house always smells like something is is really good going on in the kitchen. And when you don't smell that, I know he's been having a rough week or, or something's been going on because he's not recharging his batteries because he recharges it truly through cooking. Um, I think he does. He, he'd probably disagree. You're like, no, I, I, I do it through manly stuff, but I'm sorry. He's, he's, he's a, a fantastic chef. Um, so in Baker, because you know those different things, but you know it, it, it's such a a wonderful element to put into your NPCs. And I'm not just talking about villains. I'm not just talking about allies. I'm talking about the townsfolk, uh, the bartender that they always see the, at the tavern they always go to. And again, you know, don't go too far where it's like every person needs to have this. But for the NPCs that you want to be important, it not only gives them more soul, but it it spreads out. This person gardens. You can probably find them at a local gardening store, you know, because they have to go for supplies. Where do they garden? Well, they garden in the back of their house. Okay, so now I know they own a house. And it just allows your free fall imagination because when you start going through that Socratic method of developing NPCs, you can really see some cool stuff because you're like, and, and, and that's why I wanted to share it in this episode because I've started doing this and I'm like, wow, this is a beautiful well um, that, that, that I hope everyone can get involved in um, because I'm, I'm sitting there going, you know, I'm typing up these NPCs, NPC Y and NPC X. And I'm like, Oh, they own a house. Okay, well, this area really doesn't have houses. It mostly has, you know, trailers. Okay, so what does their trailer look like? And it led me into their residence. So if my players go and visit this person at their residence, I actually have a very good description of where they live. It's probably not going to be, you know, too vital, but it's something and it's soulful. And I've been doing it for these three games that I've been developing in the last like two weeks. And it has been amazing 
some of the stuff that I've been writing, pouring out. And so I would really encourage you all to uh, in engage in this. And there's, there's one more, uh, so I guess I did have four um, that I would like to do, and it's, it's the information section. So this is specifically for, for more for your mystery writers, right? Your Call of Cthulhu, um, or just anyone who does D&D with more of a mystery focus. I have a section called information where I literally imagine the NPC sitting in front of a black curtain, like an interview of a documentary. And I imagine the players asking them questions and them responding. Um, what I started doing was kind of, again, a waterfall technique. I said, who is the first person? I'm predicting my players. Who are the first person my players are going to talk to? And I started developing their information. And holy shit. One question led to another question, led to another question, led to another question. Tell me more about this person. And it started developing this other NPC that I haven't even started working on yet. Now, granted, I tend to do the information at the very end. I've developed my NPCs, my core NPCs, the ones who are going to be involved in this mystery. And then I build out the information because I kind of know what this person's like a little bit. So I'm not like developing NPCs on the fly. I know what they know. I know where they are. I know who's going to be there and who's not. So the cool thing about developing information in a waterfall is it, it kind of naturally fills into different people because you ask NPC A and they respond talking about NPC B, C, and D. I know the next person I'm going to fill in with their information is NPC B because they're probably going to go talk to B. And so I fill in with B and B talks about C, A, C, and D. Well, now I definitely got to do C because C has been talked about twice. So I start filling in C. And C talks about A, B, D, and now he talks about E. And it starts creating this giant web. The thing is, is what you got to know, and, and I will tell you this is where to cut it off. Okay, where does the conversation come naturally to a conclusion? All right, because trust me, you can dive down this well so fucking far. The, and one of the things that I want to tell people is information sections are great. What do they know? Who do they know? But in the end, there's still dancing involved. So don't spend too much of your energy on, well, I got to meticulously write down everything they know. No, because you never know when your player is going to ask some random ass question. And you could be in an endless cycle of developing this information because, oh man, now I got to make sure this matches with that. And it, yeah, you, can't, you, you, can't, you can't fit everything no. into there. Your development time is limited at some point. You have to produce a product at some point. This is true of anything in life, which is you can only, you, you know, if I gave you unlimited time, guess what? You'd still never finish it. No. Nope. <laughs> but if I, if I, if I, developing an AI. Yeah. If I told you that you have a, le a, a deadline for it or a time that you have to finish it, then you will finish it. You'll, you'll, you'll figure it out. You'll, you'll, you'll fill in the rest of the information. And the, the key thing that you need to remember is that you don't need to have all the information day one. You need to have enough information day one to get you to the part where you need to fill out the other information. So, which is why the surface level deep, everybody kind of is the same way. Okay, maybe you have some standard description sitting in your, your wings, some stuff that, that, that you're ready to throw out there on the fly in case somebody, they go look for some random NPC that you didn't think was gonna be a part of that. Okay, that's always a good thing to have because again, it makes that superficial level in the world, which is like, boy, this seems, it just seems really complete okay and then what you do is with all these other little bits here now you really are making it complete you're connecting people through their through their vices through their their friends their allies you're connecting people through uh the information they know uh information they know about other people like again these are all things that are really it, it makes the flow look good and a lot of this is um experience you have to do it a couple of times and when I say you mm -hmm. have to do it a couple times, you have to do it probably five or six times before you really start understanding what direction your players like to go, okay? And what direction and how much information you need to have behind 
the NPCs to really make them feel real and to kind of know when to dance out the other information and tease out the other information. And and that there sums it up. That sums it up perfectly for me. Perfect. Uh, well, anyways, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, uh, you know, please give us your thoughts. Give us your thoughts on how you like to to uh, flesh out NPCs. Um, maybe you're more of a on the fly type person with the information or descriptions. Maybe you like to have this. Um, have you ever gone too far? You know what what's what's too much for you uh, in the uh, the world of creating NPCs? Let us know. Level up your gaming podcast at gmail.com or facebook.com slash level up your gaming. Uh, you can comment on the episode, send us a message there. Uh, we are all also on YouTube. So think about a web of connections, people that you love and enjoy who recharge your batteries and then smash that like button. Love it. Um, and then, uh, like I said, you know, do, you know, give, give us your thoughts. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you know, if you aren't already subscribed to the podcast, uh, go back and listen to the other episodes. Lots of other content here. And uh, we will try to stop missing additional weeks here. Uh, but we do thank you for uh, for listening. So uh, let's get wraps up for the week. For Jared, I'm Aaron. Have a great week, everyone. Have a great week, everyone.